seat this morning. Why don't we welcome Apostle Mike as he comes Woo-hoo. to bring the word. Thank you. Well, what a t- come on, let's give the Lord a clap. What a great time of worship. What a great time in his presence. Come on, let me hear you clap. Come on, let's break out. Jesus, we honor you. We bless you. We thank you. We open our hearts to all you want to say to us today. Let your word come. Let the spirit of revelation and wisdom and understanding come upon your word. Might cause fire in our heart in Jesus' name. Everyone say it. Amen. Come on, give someone a high five before you sit down. Thank you, worship team. So good. So good. Wow, I just love the, what an atmosphere in here this morning. And so great. I want to congratulate those of you who made a decision to receive Christ. That is the beginning of a new season in your life, beginning of a new day. And... uh, I made that decision 50 years ago. I can say I've never regretted it. Life is getting better and better as I walk with Him and get to know Him. This is the beginning of a journey. All relationships start with a commitment, with a beginning, and then they progress or they don't progress. That's your decision. And uh, okay, I want you to open your Bible with me. Going to look at Matthew chapter 24. And uh, Pastor Dave has asked me to speak over two Sundays. And uh, I want to share today on the signs of the coming of Jesus, the signs of the end times, the signs of the end times. And uh, I've been doing quite a bit of study in this uh, just recently, and uh, I I know you're going to be blessed by this. It's going to stir something inside your heart. And uh, I want to especially welcome those online, and I've got friends in Australia and America, and uh, some in London, and uh, all over the world, actually. And want to welcome you and pray the Word of God will touch your heart where you are, and the same anointing in here will touch you and open and bring revelation to your heart, and cause the same fire to get inside you. Holy Ghost fire. How many know there's a global shifts are taking place? It'd be pretty hard not to realize there's a lot of changes taking place in the world. And uh, you can see the massive changes changes, and, uh, in, and uh, we've seen almost like uh, events come, and, and like when 9-11 happened, I remember thinking then, Lord, this is not just about an event that happened in America, this is about a global shift. Something is changing in the nations of the world where people felt they lived in peace and security. Now, suddenly, the realization that sudden change can take place. And then uh, there's been two waves of pandemic. There was the SARS virus, which uh, perhaps for many didn't have such an impact. But this latest one, COVID-19, suddenly, within a few days, you find yourself shut up in your home and you can't go out, you can't do this, can't do that. Life as you knew it stopped. And these are kind of beginning signs. They're kind of evidence to us of a time of change in the world. And uh, we want to uh, be anchored to the Word of God in this time. I think the first thing we need to know, if I look on the signs of the times, uh, the first thing I want you to, to look at is, uh, or to just be aware of is this, is God is in total control and in total charge. Yeah. And nothing can stop His purpose being outworked. God is in total control. Now, that doesn't mean that everything is operating the way He wants. In fact, it's not operating the way He wants, but it will come to a point where it does. And uh, it, it really helps us to see a Bible perspective. So in Isaiah, for example, Isaiah 40, 46, verse 9 and 10, uh, God says to His people, He says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there's no other. I am God. I'm the Almighty One. There is none like me. And I declare the end from the beginning. In other words, I see the whole thing. I know how it starts. I know how it ends. I got the end all fixed and sorted. I got you. And he said, from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. So what he's saying essentially is God knows the end. He has exactly an understanding of exactly how the whole thing ends. Now, we're just on the journey. We're caught in time. If you're in eternity, you can see the start and the end and what's beyond. But when you're in time, you only see what you got now. And of course, when you're in time, then you live often uh, out of the moment or out of the experience you're in now, rather than out of an eternal biblical perspective. So God always draws us back to himself and to the fact he's got your back. He's got the plan. 
get connected and listen to the plan. Let's see the outworking of his plan. Uh, in, uh, in, for example, in the book of Daniel, uh, there was a king there. Uh, the, the people of God were in a time and a season, and they were in bondage. Imagine all the promises of God have gone. Everything they treasured was gone. They're in, in captivity. They're in slavery. And there's this false prophet saying they're gonna, it's not going to happen. All kinds of things have been happening. And in the middle of it, the king of Babylon, which was the greatest world empire of its day, it would be the America of its day. Okay? And it was the greatest empire. And the king has a vision in that. And in the vision, he sees an image and he sees a head of gold and very silver and bronze, right down to feet of clay and iron. And then he sees in that uh, picture, he sees suddenly a, a rock come and the rock smites this, this image on its feet. And then the image begins to crumble and collapse and fall to the ground. And the rock that smote the feet of the image now grows and becomes a mountain that fills the whole earth. Now, what is he? And the, the king is very troubled by this, very troubled by this indeed. And so he, 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 he says to all the wise men, astrologers, can you tell me what the meaning is? I want to know the meaning of the dream. No one can tell him. So he's going to kill everyone. You guys say you're smart. You can't tell him a dream. <laughs> well, he, he said, uh, and, and Daniel said, well, give me a bit of time to seek the Lord. He knows dreams. And Daniel comes back and he says, ah, I got it. In other words, God has shown him not only the dream and its details, but also the meaning. And what Daniel, I won't give it all because that's another message of itself. I just want to give you this part of it here. And it says, uh, uh, verse, uh, Daniel 2, verse 34, he, he's saying to the king, you watched and a stone was cut out without hands. So he's talking of something supernaturally formed, without hands, meaning it's happened from God. And he says, and it struck the image on the feet of iron and clay, broke them in pieces. And it says, now, in the days of these kings, that's the kings represented by the feet, it says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Yeah. And that kingdom shall not be left to another people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and stand forever. Man, there's just a message in that verse alone. He said, inasmuch as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and broken pieces, the iron and the bronze and the clay and the silver and the gold, the great God has known, made it known to the king what shall come to pass in the future. And in fact, in that prophecy, it is a prophecy of all the world kingdoms that would come to pass. And it says in the very end time, there is a kingdom that will come. It'll be a rock taken out of a mountain and it's made without hands. And it said it'll smash that kingdom down and then it will expand and fill the whole earth. He's talking about the kingdom of God. In another place, Daniel sees it actually happening. And he says in Daniel 7 and verse 27, then the kingdom and dominion and greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the most high. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions will serve and obey him. In other words, he's had a vision of the coming kingdom of God in all its glory. He's seen what will happen. He's seen the disruption of the powers of heaven. He's seen the transformation of the earth. He's seen the kingdom of God established. And that kingdom starts in your heart. The kingdom is within you. When God puts his spirit in you, you are joined to the king. You become part of a kingdom. However, you've got to decide whether you will grow. You have to decide whether you let the Spirit of God bring transformation. You have to decide whether you let the Lord prepare you so that at the time of His coming, number one, you're ready, and number two, you qualify for all the things He has prepared for those who love Him. What an amazing, whoa, I get excited, whoa, hallelujah. So the Bible, the Bible then is a, is a, is a book, it's God's book, it's His story. It's his story. And, and in his story, there are many prophecies through the Bible. And the prophecies in the Bible all refer and uh, they, they, they carry a revelation of Jesus and his work. So, for example, when Jesus was born, when Jesus, in Jesus' life and ministry, many people don't realize there were at least 18 prophecies, specific details about his life that were prophesied through the Bible by different prophets. And all of those will fulfill. Now, if you show me a book where 18 events are prophesied and they all come true, you've got to say, well, I need to take that book seriously. 
And then there's about another 16 prophecies about Israel and what would happen to Israel, and all of those have become true. So if you've got prophecies or foretelling of the future, firstly about the coming of Jesus, and secondly about the nation of Israel, and all of those ones have been fulfilled, that's a pretty good record. And if it's a pretty good record, then you want to say this, what other prophecies are there? What other things are there in the Bible foretelling the future? about Israel, and also about Jesus and his second return. So there's a whole heap of prophecies about Jesus coming, about his return, of which the church remains ignorant. And if you're ignorant of what is coming, you live in fear of what is now. You ever look across the world, everyone's scared. What are you scared of? I mean, to act rationally, reasonably, and safely, that's one thing, but to be in fear, that's another. That's another. So I want us to go then, and where we're gonna, this is where we're leading up to. We see then that God knows the beginning from the end. God has got a plan. He's out working. And we see then that the prophecies in the Bible then are accurate. The Bible can be relied upon because God knows the end from the beginning. So if we were to read today some prophecies of things to come, you better know they're going to come. They will unravel as certainly as you're sitting here. The only question is whether you recognize they're unraveling before your very eyes. We're living in the hour when these things are unraveling now. What a great hour to be alive. What an hour to be alive. Whoa. Glory to God. Let's read to Matthew chapter 24. And Matthew chapter 24, we won't read it all. I'll read about 14 verses. And uh, Jesus brings revelation of the end times. In other words, he acts as a prophet. I don't know how many of you realize Jesus not only was a great apostle, he's also a great prophet that was prophesied by Moses. Another prophet will come. And he's the great prophet. So he's now standing in his office as a prophet, and he's now saying, I'm going to tell you things are going to happen at the end times. I'm going to prophesy for you the next 2,000 years. That'd be worthwhile listening to, wouldn't it? So then verse uh, 21, verse 1. Uh, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him uh, the buildings of the temple. And of course, the buildings were massive. They were massive size. It was glorious. One of the wonders of the world, really. And uh, just tremendous building. And Jesus said, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone will be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, that's a staggering thing. Now, he's now prophesying. They're all saying, man, look at this awesome building. Wow, look, the gold, all the beauty of it, massive. He says, guys, the whole lot's going to be thrown down. There won't be two stones left on top of one another. How about that? That's a whole study of its own to find out what happened in there. And then we're just going to touch on it as we go. So then he goes on, he, he sits down. And so they ask him a couple of questions. Now, if Jesus had just told you, just admired this big building. And Jesus said, guys, don't put your hopes in the building. The building's coming down. And so, of course, when they got alone, they sat and talked, and they asked him some questions. They said, now, as they sat in the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. So what private, that's what disciples do. They ask questions privately. And he said, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Those are two key questions that are asked here. These things about the destruction of the temple, what will indicate it's happening? And two, what will be the signs that indicate your return is imminent? And Jesus then answers that. And you'll find his answers spread, as they often are in the Bible, in more than one place. You've got to read in the different places to find them. But Matthew 24 is a good place, 24, 25, a good place to start. You can go into Mark 13. You can also go into Luke 21. But we'll just mostly look in uh, Matthew, and then we'll look a little bit in, uh, in Luke. Okay, so let's carry on. They said, and, as he had, and this is what he said. He answered them and said, take heed that no one deceives you. So his first thing is to warn them of the possibility of being deceived. To be deceived means that that you think something's true and it's not true. He says, and now he's warning his disciples. In fact, he repeats this warning. Take care in case you be deceived. In other words, that you start to believe things that are not true as though they are true, and that affects how you live your life. In other words, there's a rea- you're living in a wrong perception of what's happening. He warns his disciples, his apostles, take heed or be careful about this. And then he goes on and he begins to to say some more things. And he said, uh, for many will come in my name saying I'm the Christ and deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. Don't be anxious when you hear all these reports or read the news. All these things must come to pass, but that's not the end. 
okay? And he said, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, there'll be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. He says then, so that's after that, some other things are going to happen. He says, then they'll deliver you up to the tribulation and kill you, and they'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Oh, and then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will arise and deceive many. Notice the then, then, then. So he's talking about a sequence of steps or actions that'll take place one after the other. And he says, but he who endures till the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom of God will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. Then the end will come. So you've actually now got an idea what must come before the end. And we're not waiting for anyone or anything. God is waiting for us. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached throughout the whole world. Then the end will come. So you don't wait around for Jesus to come. You pray and get busy. Pray and get busy. So, <laughs> so notice now, we're going to look at the first. He's asked two questions now. The first question in verse 3 was, what is the, so what will these things be? So he's, they're asking about the temple. What about the temple? Tell us about the temple. And uh, now, in Luke 21, verse 20, it's described a little differently. Uh, Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know its desolation is near. So he's now giving them a sign. He's saying, when you see this, you know. This is what you can absolutely be certain to know, that its desolation or its total ruin is very close. So, so that's the sign he's given them, and there's the consequence, It'll, it's about to be destroyed. So, and then he tells them what to do. So always in the Bible, God gives a hint or a, an indication of what will come, and then he tells us how to prepare. Tells us how to prepare. So next week, I'll talk about preparing for the second coming of the Lord, because you need to know how to prepare. But of course, if you don't believe that he's coming soon, then of course you won't want to prepare. You'll no, no, do, do my own thing. Okay, that's what he said. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of, uh, uh, of her depart. So he tells them, get out of the city when you see the sign. And it says, let not those in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all the things may be written, may be fulfilled. And woe to those who are pregnant, those with babies in those days, for there'll be great distress in the land, great wrath upon the people. They'll fall by the edge of the sword, be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And notice here's the sign. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. Now, when I was in uh, Rome, we did a visit to Rome one time, and we went around the, the city. I just loved it. Just the history is stunning. And we went through what's called the Arch of Titus. And the Arch of Titus is a phenomenal structure. It's an arch, but it's a memorial arch. It was built in honor of Titus. Who was Titus? Titus was a Roman general. And when you look on the inside of the arch, you see some interesting thing. You see uh, uh, inscribed on the side of the arch, on one side, it's got there a Roman emperor, in a it's got a Roman uh, a general in a chariot, and then behind, it's got people in chains who are captive, and then behind that, it's got loads of treasure, and particularly one item of treasure is the candlestick or the menorah from the temple in Jerusalem. It's there, you can go there and see it now. Now, Jesus said... When you see the sign, that's what's going to happen. When you go to Rome now, you see the picture that it did happen. So what happened? Well, what happened is uh, there was a rebellion in, in, uh, in Judea around about the period of about 66 AD, and they began to rise up against the Romans. And so the Romans set an emperor, uh, a, a military commander called Vespasian. And Vespasian surrounded Jerusalem, set up a siege around Jerusalem. The sign when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. Wow. There it is, right there. Now, what do you think the believers who remember Jesus' words all thought when they saw the armies encamped around them? Jesus told us this would happen. We need to get out. And of course, they can't get out because they're surrounded. Then suddenly, there's a death of a Roman emperor. And so Vespasian is going to replace him. He's going to become the new emperor. So they call him to come back to Rome to take over his new role as the emperor. So he withdraws all his armies from Jerusalem and goes back for a short period to Rome in order to, re to, to receive his uh, positioning as emperor and then to take over the emperor and the running of the empire. Now, of course, now he's the running of the empire. He's not going back to Jerusalem, so he sends Titus. 
So there is a gap. The armies surround the, the city. Then the armies withdraw from the city. Then the armies return and surround the city. So there was a window of time. And in that window of time, everyone who remembered Jesus' words, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, flee. Don't come into the city. And so history records that every Christian in that city left the city. And they went to a town, I think it's called Bala, somewhere in uh, East Judea or West Judea or somewhere in another place. So all the Christians left. That just left. It must have been amazing to watch them all leaving the city. Thousands upon thousands of Christians left the city. Of course, they're leaving, they're just leaving everything, giving up their jobs, giving up everything. Everything they have built, struck, everything, they, take, they, they leave with whatever they can carry and go away. Why? Because they've heard Jesus' words. When you see this, it's all about to be destroyed. Now, you can imagine the difficulty that people would have and the act of faith it requires to let everything go because you've heard the word of Jesus. And everything looks so comfortable. The enemies have all retired. We're doing okay now. We're all right. But very soon, Titus came. He encamped around it. He besieged it. He cut off all supplies to the city. He starved the occupants and then breached the city. And when he breached the city, he put, there were, I think, about 3 million people there. I think he put 2 million to death. 2 million to death. A lot of people died trying to escape. No one was able to escape. People tried to get out, but they couldn't escape because they built literally a wall right around it. There's no escaping. And people that did come out, they got a, a rumor went around that they had swallowed jewels and diamonds, and so they killed them and gutted them. It's like there was just no way you could escape. There was no escape now because they weren't ready and responsive to the Word of God. And so about a million people were carried away as slaves, which is what's represented on the Arch of Titus in Rome. And they said the story, or what you read in history, is there were so many slaves, they just went for almost nothing. They were sold cheaply. And what's called the time of the Gentiles began. When, what does it mean by the time of the Gentiles? Time of the Gentiles, the Gentiles refers to people outside of Israel, the, the people outside the covenant of God, and they ruled over and had dominion over the land of Israel, and that went on and on and on until there's going to be a change because of the promises of God. So let's come on, read on. This is exciting, isn't it? Now, so when did all that change? Well, it changed in my lifetime. Changed in my lifetime. You see, the times of the Gentiles ceased, 1948. Israel got rid of all the British and took over that place, which is a source of conflict. If I was to ask what city in the whole world is the source of conflict, you know what it is. It's Jerusalem. That's where Jesus is returning again. So it's like it's going to be the governmental center of the earth. So, of course, it's the source of all conflict. See? And so uh, it, the Jews took over. And then 1967, for the first time, apart from being a nation, now they took over the temple area or the area there in the old city. And so now they had access to Jerusalem. And, uh, of course, there's still been a battle because there's still a mosque there that the Muslims have claiming that this is their ground. But it is not their ground. This, this is the land promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Israel will possess the land. So you've got to think, when you hear all these arguments about the Middle East, where do you stand? Will you stand on God's side, agreeing with what he says is going to happen? Or will you take the world view or the secular media view and, and take the view of all the people who are so critical of, what, of what's happening in the Middle East? I'm not saying it's not all right or wrong. It's just you've got to get God's perspective. Amen? Yeah. You've got to get God's perspective. Now, and, and this is so, so exciting. Here's another thing. Last year... Last year, last year, Donald Trump moved the embassy and called Jerusalem the capital. That is historic. It's historic. It's a, when you see it in the bigger picture of what God is doing, you see it's totally historic. And, uh, and we'll see some things on this and that actually in the Scripture. He tells about that. Oh, how about that? All right then. So, so now... We now want to look at just the end times. What are the signs then of the end times? What are the signs that we are approaching the end times? Now, Jesus made it very clear. You won't know the day and you won't know the hour. So if anyone says they know the day and give a date, they got it wrong. And if anyone tells you the hour, then they got it wrong as well. He said, no man knows the hour nor the day. Only the Father, even Jesus doesn't know the day. So don't think some smart aleck with his Bible knows the day. They don't know the day. 
But what you can know is the seasons. And so it's the seasons we've got to know. So Jesus warns about it. So the first thing he did was he warned about deception. Verse, 20, verse 4, Jesus answered and said, take heed, no one deceives you. So the only, there's only one remedy for deception. Here it is. It's found in the book of Thessalonians. Receive a love for the truth. Be passionate about truth. Be passionate about the Word of God. You need to grow and learn the Word of God and find out what God has to say. If you don't know what God says, you're a prime candidate to believe something wrong. You just won't know. We should be students of the Word of God. We need to have a love for the Word. And even more in the day we live, because look, when you turn on the news, when you look at social media, you've got to understand this. It is all being manipulated to present a narrative depending on who's saying the thing. And so whatever you read is distorted with an agenda behind it. That leaves you open to deception. And, and of course, I see people spend all the time on news media. Well, where's your Bible? Why aren't you learning the Word of God? You're just a prime candidate for deception because you're going to follow what the world is saying. You're going to follow people who hate you, have an agenda, that are presenting a case that's not true, deliberately are presenting a narrative, not the news. You've got to see these things. That's the hour we're living in. We have never lived in an hour quite this, like this one. So it's one of the things. Jesus warned about end time deception, and you'll find that most of these things provide a narrative that is contrary and contradictory and hostile to the values of the kingdom of God. So you need to know the values of the kingdom of God and God's order for relationships. If you don't know God's kingdom order, then you'll take on board and just come into agreement Tolerance soon leads to agreement. And what you'll find is that the narrative that's presented in the world, as we'll come to it shortly, is hostile to the kingdom of God. It has another spirit arising, the spirit of Antichrist, rising to oppose the kingdom of God and eternal values. And if you're not aware of that, you'll just draw into it and then tolerate it and be part of it. You'll build that way. And we've already got a whole generation of families that are destroyed because they bought into all of this stuff. Okay then, so build your life on the Word of God, not on the social media or even the news. Okay, here's the second thing. Jesus warned about the beginning of sorrows, Matthew 24, verse 8. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Beginnings, the word beginning means the commencement of a series of things happening. The word sorrows is the word meaning a childbirth. It's literally a childbirth, to bring a child to birth. Now, any woman who's here understands what that's like. Most men haven't got a clue. Oh, the child's born. Yeah, they were. Oh, I was there. Isn't that great? You know, but women all understand. Whoa. Once those pains start, you're on the journey to a child being born. There ain't no stopping that journey. You can't say, oh, nope, I've decided no. I've, I've changed my mind. I don't want to. No, it's going to happen. And every day you've got a reminder of it. Every day your body's showing the fatigue and the effort. And then the pains start. And the pains come and they come and they're quite a And they ask, how far apart are the pains? Oh, quite a long way. Quite a long way. Then they start getting closer and closer. How close, are the, how close are the pains now? Oh, you better get in the car and get to the hospital. You are about to have a baby. So that's what he's saying. If you understand about babies being born, you'll understand this is what happens in the end times. There is a painful situation, then it's followed by another painful situation, then another, then another, then another, then another, getting closer and closer together, then what God has decided to do will suddenly birth into the earth and surprise everyone. But it won't surprise you if you know that it's about like a child, a spiritual childbirth, and that there's a sequence to look for that will happen. Okay, let's keep going on these things. Okay, beginning of sorrows. So, so what are the beginning of sorrows? Well, the beginning of sorrows is simply this. It's worldwide conflicts. The beginning of sorrows are worldwide conflicts. Notice what he says. Uh, he says, what are the birth pains? Matthew 24, verse 6. And you will hear wars and rumors of war. See that you're not upset or troubled. These things will come to pass, but that's not the end yet. So lots of wars. And he said, a nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines and diseases and earthquakes in diverse places. So wars and natural disasters are the first sign. Now you notice here he says, kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation. So kingdom against kingdom refers to political wars. In other words, they're wars 
uh, by one government against another government to gain dominion and power. So World War I and World War II are what you call political wars. They're wars to expand territory, to take the territory that belongs to someone else. And of course, in the course of World War I and World War II, there's been millions of lives lost. And then the second type of war are what you call ethnic wars, where it says nation against nation. And uh, the majority of that word nation is the word ethnos, meaning ethnic. So ethnic speaks of a particular group of people, certain culture, certain language often, certain ways of doing things, certain history they have. That's an ethnic group. And the Bible tells us that ethnic groups will rise against ethnic groups. Now, of course, we're all happy in New Zealand, so you've got a clue what's going on most of the time, unless you know to look. But let me just have a talk about some of the, 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 uh, the ethnic wars. 1913, the Armenians were killed by the Turks. They're still in denial about it. A million of people, more than a million people. And they were crucified, they were tortured, they were sold into slavery, they were put to death. That was all ethnic ethnic and religious. It was radical Islam against Christians. 1941, the Nazis and the Jews. Millions killed. An ethnic war. 1947 in Kashmir, Indians, Pakistanis. Ethnic war. 1978 in Afghanistan, ethnic war. 1991 in Somalia, still going on. 1997, Rwanda, some of you'd remember 1997, the Rwanda, the Hutus and the Tutsis, and the millions that were slaughtered. What was it all about? It's tribal ethnic wars. Tribal ethnic wars. Millions killed, slain. Iraq, 2003, Sudan. Sudan's still in turmoil right now, in poverty and turmoil, and it's religious and ethnic wars. In Nigeria, most people don't know what's going on in Nigeria. You realize, uh, but you would read a Boko Haram. Boko Haram is, is, a, is, a, is a word meaning, literally, it's, it's a word that speaks against Western education, against Western education. And it's basically radical Islamists, and they're against Christians, they're against people of other tribes and groups, and they're killing them. They kill them every week. Every week, people have been killed. Every week. People have been killed. If you get the right access to the right news and find out what's happening in the globe, you'll find out what's going on. So, so this is happening. You think of other countries, North Korea, uh, people were, uh, were shot just for having a Bible. And so it goes on. Uh, China, China's got the greatest wave of persecution against religious freedom right now and against ethnic minorities. It is in an all-scale war against them. They've got literally intern, turn, internment camps with more than a million people, we just from the northern area. They say it's re-education. It's not re-education, it's, it's a prison camp. And, uh, and right now, the persecution against the church has increased right across China right now. Even the uh, organized church or the three-self church, even that is suffering right now. So they want the Ten Commandments down. They want the doctrine of the communist, Chinese Communist Party up there. They want the Chinese Communist Party to be God in the nation. So no other God is acceptable. This is like Nebuchadnezzar's day when they put up the big image and said, everyone must worship it. And three men stood up and said, we won't. And God redeemed them and saved them and promoted them. Uh, so, so when you look, you see them there, they're in Somalia, Libya, Iraq. You have a look right in the Middle East and take a, take a look there, what's happened there in the Middle East. All the ethnic wars have been going on in our time. Millions killed. Millions killed and displaced. This is in our day, this is happening. This is happening now. While we sit comfortable in New Zealand, it's happening in the world. And Hebrews 13 tells us not to, to ignore the suffering that's going on in other nations among the family of God. Amen? Okay, so, so, so Christians then are the most... Pers Currently, Christians are the most persecuted religious group in the whole world right now. There are more people killed for faith in Christ now than at any time in history. In China, they are paying people to dob in the ones they know are Christians. You understand? Now, what, so this is not to just shock you. It's just to make you aware this is a sign of the times. This is the sign of the end times. Just one of the signs. And uh, so we see that happening there. And uh, so uh, th the, the next sign I want to share is a worldwide hatred against Christians. Worldwide hatred against Christians. So there's ethnic wars. You can think of the pandemics. There's earthquakes. Frequency of earthquakes seems to me to be bigger, and we're far more aware of earthquakes, major earthquakes now, shaking up nations all over the earth. The issue of the COVID is something we've never seen in our lifetime, of the whole world pretty well being shut down. These are all signs leading to something. They're all the birth pains. And these are all these natural signs. Jesus said, that's only the beginning. That's right. 
That's only beginning. Man, if you're, like Pastor Dave said, if you can't handle the footmen, how are you going to handle the horses? If, if, you, if you're upset by little stuff now, how are you going to handle big stuff when it comes? The reason God brings our attention to this is so we'll prepare. So we'll prepare. It's all to prepare the church. I love it. <laughs> so there's a spirit of hatred being released right across the world to all who follow Christ. And uh, it's horrendous. And, uh, and so if you make a stand for Christ, you make a stand for Christian values, you make a stand for godly marriage, you make a stand for purity, make a stand. If you build your life around those things, you are now a target. There is a spirit of hatred released right through the world against Christians and followers of Christ. It's a rise of an antichrist spirit. I, I read an article and it said there were relentless persecutions against Christians in over 140 countries in the world. Imprisoned, tortured, enslaved, raped, sold into slavery, sold into forced marriages, all kinds of things. It's happening now. Now, what about in, in the West? Well, in the West, it's a little bit different, but here it is. In the West, increasing hatred is being shown towards anyone who has either a conservative or a Christian or a Bible perspective of life. Increasing hatred. And you may even come across it yet, but you'll come across it, I can tell you. And the strategy, and, and this is, it's a little, it, it, basically the way it is, if you hold an opinion different from the progressive left, you will be vilified. It's not like, oh, well, I disagree. I've got my opinion, you've got yours. No. You hold a different opinion, and there will be literally a whole range of things happening. They will uh, name you, blame you, shame you, attack and destroy you in every way possible. In other words, a person holding a Christian view in much of the Western world now is likely to be bullied publicly and privately. That's, that, see, and this is, and, and what you find, if I, as I've looked around the world, what I see is I see two forces coming together. I see uh, religion and politics. So you see the political system, the far left particularly, and you see the religious system, Islam, coming together and forming friendships. What have they got in common? They've got nothing in common. If you go to any of the countries where there's radical Islam, you find they kill homosexuals. They don't promote them. The left is promoting them. So how can they come together? It's because they have a common enemy. And the common enemy is Christ. You have to see what the common enemy is. And it's actually in the Bible. It tells us there in um, Mark 3, verse 6, the Pharisees went out and plotted with the Herodians how they could kill Jesus. The Pharisees were religious. Herodians were political. They had nothing to do with one another. What brought them together was a common hatred. This, this, is what, this is what's emerging in the world now. Once your eyes are open, you can see it. And Jesus taught people how to respond. He, say, he said, when it happens, when you get hated by all men for my sake, then rejoice and be glad for your reward will be great in heaven. He said, don't, don't get all, oh no, it's all bad. No, he said, listen, when this comes, they realize you got something and that you're a danger and a threat and they're pushing back on you and it's because you identify with Jesus Christ. Man, stand up, hold your ground, rejoice because God says he will reward those who will stand their ground and faithfully serve him. <laughs> Hallelujah. He tells them, he said, you love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who uh, hate you and so on and despitefully use you and persecute you. Okay, so the next, thing, uh, the next sign is this. This is a good one. The next sign will be offenses and hatred among Christians. So even the church isn't going to be going too good in some places. Ah, how about this? In Matthew 24, verse 10, he says, many will be offended and will betray one another and hate one another. Many, many, many Christians carrying offenses in the heart. The question is, are you carrying offenses in your heart? Offenses inevitably are about relationships with authority people over us. Offenses, the word literally means to be scandalized. It referred to the bait in a trap. So literally, when you set a trap for a bird, you put the bait in, and the thing you attached it to was the, what's called the scandal on. That's the, that's the offense. That's the, tra that's the trap stick. And the trap stick, you, the, the bird would see that and come and eat the food, and the trap closes. And so it's very easy to want to be offended by people. <gasps> people get offended everywhere. You know, they happen to have in some places safe spaces. Some of you may not have heard of that. Safe spaces means I'm not allowed to say things in case I might offend you. It's happening in the American education system now, right through up to tertiary. I've got to be careful about trigger words in case I upset you and hurt you with the words I say and my opinion might be different to yours. 
That's because people are growing up with an offended spirit. They're growing up with an offended spirit, so little things offend them. Little things offend them. And then it becomes, well, now that's hate speech if you've offended them. So they've taken away having a different opinion to mean you hate them. How wrong is that? That's why we have to have a love for the truth. We need a love for the truth. So offense is a horrendous thing. Offenses lead to betrayal in relationships and then open hatred. And it's, it's far easier than to, to, to get into the state than you realize. So why do people get offended? So to be offended means to be tripped up. So you're running well, then you trip up and fall on your face. So a lot of Christians are in that state. They're tripped up and fall on their face. Maybe like that now. So what happens? It happens for two reasons. One, you, you were treated unfairly something, some injustice took place. That happens. Welcome to the world. It happens. It happens everywhere. Racial things happen everywhere. They've been happening all through history. They're happening everywhere. It's just in the West you hear about it in the media because they're making a show of it right now. It doesn't mean that something didn't happen. Something's really wrong. There's injustice. But the problem is not that there's injustice. The first thing is what does it do to you? Are you a carrier of injustice and offense, or are you a carrier of healing and restoration in life? You've got to understand, you can't be both. Yes. If you're carrying of injustice and offense, you'll be angry and hate, and then you'll destroy. And we think, oh, that's America. That's not us. No, 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 it happens here too. Come on, come on. So the two reasons we're offended, one is they've been treated badly or unjustly or unfairly. They've got a real genuine grievance to get over, or they think they have. <laughs> that's where Christians get stuck they think oh it wasn't fair it wasn't treated right and that's they get upset so, so, so usually it comes out of unmet expectations well, I thought you were going to do that and you didn't I'm upset no you're offended get over it deal with it address it in a godly way otherwise it's going to stumble you and, feel, and you'll end up breaching the relationship so when people get offended they get so focused on themselves they don't realize they're trapped in a snare their focus what? Their focus is not on Jesus. Their focus is not on being like him. Their focus is not on being able to love people and bless people and restore relationships. Their focus is on me and my and mine. Uh, they focus on the injustice and the hurt. And, and while they're focusing on injustice and hurt, they're not aware I've got offended heart. I've got, I'm operating under pride. The pride blinds my heart condition. I can't see because I'm so full of myself. So Proverbs 18, 19, a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. Contentions like bars of a castle. So an offended person will build a wall around their heart. Now get this, they build a wall around their heart, but they will let in one kind of person. Who will they open their heart, let their heart in? Oh, another offended person. Oh, you're offended too. Oh, let me tell you about my offense. And they let him in. And now not, they're not sharing the life of Christ. They're not sharing blessing. Now they're sharing offense, the spirit of offense. And bitterness and hatred begins to grow. And this goes on all the time. They just want someone who will agree with me. Now, if I think you agree with me, now I'll share and welcome you in. The problem is when people are offended like that, they misinterpret the actions of people. So if you've got an offense in your heart, you'll misinterpret everything. Especially if it's an offense against your father or your mother, you'll have issues with authority all your life. One of the biggest issues offenses come in the church is when we have expectations that are not met. We are, oh, but I thought. And we maybe didn't even realize there was an expectation. We just get offended. Or when pastors or leaders try to help you grow up and talk into your life something you can't see because you're blinded by your offense. And then, instead of welcoming the truth and loving the truth, even though it hurts, ah, oh, that's so. People get more offended. Now they're even more angry and more offended. Now the wall gets up. Now, of course, what Jesus said is, many will become offended and betray one another and hate one another, so it's going to progress now. You're not going to stay static if the offense is in your heart. Now what you're going to do is you're going to sell the person out to their enemies. You go to someone who also hates them and share your story with them and give them more fuel for the fire. Yeah. You're betraying the relationship you had. You will withdraw from a relationship that was important. Maybe God ordained that relationship. You've withdrawn because of your pride and offense, and now you've walked away. And now what's happened? Now you betrayed the relationship. You sold them out by sharing confidences or you sold them out by withdrawing when you were most needed. That goes on all the time. You know what it's evidence of? Pride and immaturity. Immaturity. It's time to grow up. We cannot stay in that state. We can't remain like that. We must have a love for the truth. 
Who could speak into your life in a way that you won't get offended and upset and take a hike? And when someone last tried to say something to you, how did you respond? Are you a lover of the truth and welcome the truth? Or is your pain and your hurt so driving you and preoccupying you that all you can do is react? You understand, Jesus said in the last days, many will be offended, multitudes, and will betray one another and then hate one another. How do you hate people? Well, lots of ways. It can be uh, active by hostilely uh, coming against them, or it can be just in this way. The word hatred in the Bible means to love less or withhold love. So you, you may not think you hate people, but when you withhold love, is something wrong? Yep, nope. Nothing wrong. No, 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 no. I won't talk about it. Build a wall. Just walk away further and further. You're not walking away from that person. You're walking away from God. He's trying to help you, to grow you, because he needs you mature in the end times. He needs you to grow in the end times. He needs you to be in a good place spiritually and relationally. He needs you locked into a community of people that can help you grow and support you and help you in your journey. He wants you connected. And offenses are the main stumbling block of the, of the devil to take people out of God-given relationships that were designed to help them and bless them. Isn't that incredible? The three things, four things that I notice comes whenever there's offenses. Number one is distance, relational distance. Because now you're, you're preoccupied, not with love and building together. You've now got another agenda, preserving yourself. In, Psalm, in Proverbs 81, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire and rages against all wise judgment. First one's distance. Second one are demons. When you, when you allow offenses to get in your heart, you will become demonized. You will. Jesus said that will happen. That's again a prophecy. <laughs> Matthew 18, 34 and 35. He said, if you will not from your heart forgive your brother, everyone his trespasses, then you will be handed over to the tormentors. In other words, unforgiveness and offense in our heart leaves an open door for demonic spirits to wreak havoc torment you with remembering all the things that were done against you, causing you to be angry and upset. They torment you. Someone shares something that you read something or see something on the news. Now you're angry and you don't know why you're even angry. Why are you angry? We're just watching some dots on the screen. No, there was something tapped into the spirit that was there and stirred up your anger, stirred up your issue. Whoa, you're all quiet now. The third one's deception. Deception comes when you're offended because you become blinded and you can't see why your life's going the way it is. You can't see the truth when you've got offense in your heart. In 1 John 2 verse 11, it says, when there's hatred in our heart, when we've withdrawn love because of offense, it says we walk in darkness and we can't work out what we're stumbling over. So when you're offended, you have a lot of things go wrong in your life and you can't work out why these things are happening because you can't see if you can't see, it's like you keep tripping up all the time and you can't work out why you're having these setbacks. It's because your heart is offended. There's anger and hate in the heart and now you can't see. The, the hatred blinds your eyes. It causes you to be in a spiritual darkness where you have no perception. Then when the word of God is preached, you don't even pick anything up. But these are important things. In the last days, many, many, many like that. So there's deception's another one. And then the last one's defilement, defilement defilement will come because in Hebrews 12 verse 15 it says make sure everyone guard their heart keep themselves in the grace of God why do they need to do that lest a root of bitterness spring up and defile many so uh, injustices hurts offenses anger they breach all our relationships so they firstly cause you to have walls and become demonically uh, empowered then they cause, a, they cause an isolation. Then they overflow with defilement. Yeah. You start to poison your marriage, poison your children, poison your friendships and relationships. Everywhere, the bitterness flows like a river. Wow. That's not what we're to be. We're to be, the, we're, we're to be the house of God where the river of life flows out of. And that river of life can only flow out of a pure heart. It can only have a heart that's free of offense. You've got to keep yourself free of offense. Yeah. Someone offends you, forgive them. Just yeah. forgive them. Forgive them, and if it's breached the relationship, go have a talk. Pray, get your heart right, get all the anger out of it, or you'll end up with a bigger row than you had before. You can't fix a relationship if you're angry. 
get over your anger, get over your injustice, come to a place and grow some meekness in your heart because meekness in the eyes of God is very high price. So offenses get you out, meekness gets you in. You could not opt, but you don't because you've surrendered to the Lord and you understand that he permits offenses in order to grow your character of meekness like he had. He was reviled and offended and didn't react. He could have, like on the cross, they're all, they're giving him a hard time, you know, and he could have called down angels and burned them up. That would have been fun. <laughs> Burn everyone up. He didn't do that. It's his meekness and his humility caused him to be separated to the purpose of God. He had a joy ahead of him seeing people like you and me coming out of darkness, coming out of the dark place, coming into a place of life, coming into the things God has for us, free of offense, free of these things. He did it for us. Yeah. Well, I'd love to have done more today, but I'm going to run out of time. <laughs> all, hey, you'd like to hear some more, but we won't hear it today. I think we'll just have to come back to that. I'll open up some other things on it. And notice what he said, you'll be betrayed over to your enemies. It says in Luke 21, 16, he says, you'll even be betrayed by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they'll put you to death. So we have to understand then, the signs of the times we're in. Wars, rumors of war, ethnic conflicts, famines in diverse places, pestilences or viruses that no one can do anything about. That's the hour we're living in now. That's the hour you and I are in right now. Wow. And he says these are just the beginning of all kinds of things that will come on the earth, and they're leading up to the return of Jesus Christ, the overthrow of the kingdoms of the world, and the establishment of his kingdom. He has got you in a preparation process. So he gives you a heads up. Guys, when you see these kings coming, what do you need to do? He says, watch and pray. Watch and pray. So there's a whole number of things we're called to do to prepare ourselves. I can't do it all in one session. But next Sunday, I'll, I think I'll continue this one. I want to talk more and finish on some of the other signs of the hour we live in. Because you need to kind of have there, this is what to look for. Because they are in a sequence and they will come, and then they just come in the sequence. Now, if you have a look right now, you can see right now how difficult the issue of offenses is, how widespread opposition and hatred for the things of God are. You see and feel in the world a gathering momentum of the Antichrist spirit against everything that's good and right. It's not about left versus right. On the right, there's people just as bad as well. On the extreme right, you've got fanatical people. On the extreme left, you've got fanatical people. In religion, you've got fanatical people. God is looking for kingdom people that are not caught up in political games. They say, I want to stand for the kingdom of God. I want to be a part of that rock that brings down the kingdoms of the world and fills the whole earth and makes Jesus Christ Lord. It says in the book of uh, Matthew, it says, it says, when the last sign comes, I have to share that another time. It says, then they shall see the Son of Man coming in the glory, His own glory, and the glory of His Father, and the glory of all the angels, and His reward shall be with Him to give every man according to His works. Listen, our greatest day is ahead of us. There is a global revival. There's a global moving of the Spirit of God in preparation for the return of Jesus Christ. Right now, we need to in our heart say, God, I see I've been asleep. My prayer life has been slack. Lord, I've been compromising. I've been offended. I've been in my heart. Lord, turn against people. Today I repent. Today I come back. I want to watch and pray. I want to be a man or woman of prayer. I want to be a child of God. I want to be right at the forefront of what you're doing. Holy Ghost, come upon me. I need a fresh encounter even today, Holy Spirit. Come on, church, let's stand. Let's stand right now. Come on, let's begin to worship him.
on to you. We worship you. You are coming in majesty. You are coming in glory. You are coming with great power. We honor you, Jesus. What a privilege to be a part of your kingdom. What an honor to be a child of God. What a privilege to have such a destiny and calling. Father, we love you. Jesus, we love you. We honor you, Jesus. Come on, let's worship him. Lift your hands and worship him. Perhaps there's some of you today. You're saying, God, I need to repent. I've become lukewarm. My prayer life is gone. I'm in the news more than I'm in the Word of God. Lord, I got offenses in my heart. Lord, help me today. I see I'm living in an important hour. Lord, put a fresh vision in my heart. I need a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I need you to come. Come, come. I present my life. I build an altar to Jesus Christ. I will live my life in these difficult times. I will endure. I will persevere. I will be on the Lord's side. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve that eternal kingdom. Lord, we honor you. Father, we pray your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let heaven come. Let heaven come to earth. Come to me. Cause fire to come in me. Yours is the glory. Come on, let's sing that song. Sing that chorus. Yours is the kingdom. If you need to get your life right with God, make your way to the front right now. You need a fresh encounter. Come to the front right now. God wants to put a spirit of prayer on you. Wants to put a spirit of faith on you. When the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Will he find persevering prayer? Will he find purity? Will he find his people who love him? Will he find true worshipers? Will he find in you a heart set on the kingdom? Oh, yes, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever. Amen. Come on, more time. Yeah, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. your kingdom come. Come in power. Come in majesty. Every eye shall see him. Every eye shall see him. Every knee shall bow to him. Everyone shall declare he is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. Come Lord Jesus. We cry out come Lord Jesus. We cry out come Lord Jesus. We cry out, come, Lord Jesus. The spirit of the bride say, come. Come, Lord Jesus. We say, come, Lord Jesus. We cry out, come, come, come in glory. Come in power. Come in majesty. Where yours is the glory forever. Amen. Lord, we love you. Just stay in that place of worship. In worship, we bow before him, before his majesty and his holiness. God is speaking to us in this hour. 
prepare for his coming. Prepare yourself. Grow. Change. Don't just carry on. Set your heart. God, I need a personal revival. I want to have a deep intimacy with you. I want a deep intimacy with you. Opening my heart, hearing your heart, communing with you. Lord, I want you to transform my life. Heal the broken places. Come to the places my life is imprisoned with fear and bitterness and disappointment and grief and injustice and defilements. Uncover all those places. I invite you to come. I want to change. I can't do it by myself. I need you to come with healing, deliverance, revelation. I want to become like Jesus Christ. Lord, help me to be faithful. Faithful in the small assignment you have given me. You have entrusted me. Let me see every assignment I have as an act of worship and bring your presence into it. Just the little things at home, the little things that are insignificant that you're interested in. Let me do them to you as an act of worship. Lord, I see the signs of the end times. And I commit to your word and your spirit to be changed and ready for your coming. Just let the Spirit of God rest on you right now. He's speaking to some of you. There's things to let go of. They're not necessarily bad things. They're just distractions. There's things He's wanting to build in your life, in your marriage, with your children, in your finances. This is an hour of change. Whenever God calls us to change, He will provide the power to do it. He just wants you to be available. Jesus, you have captured my heart. I hear the cry of the bridegroom. You are coming. I want my lamp to be filled with oil and to burn with a passion for you. I sense the Spirit of God is touching many people. See, some are weeping. God is touching you. He loves you. He's drawing you right now. He's drawing you. Just respond to Him. His presence is here. His glory is in this house. There are angels in this place. If you need a miracle, reach out to Him for it now. From the first time I heard about things of the Spirit, the thing I cried for almost more than any was the Spirit of prophecy, the revelation of Jesus. Today, Lord, in Jesus' name, I decree new beginnings for the members, the families, the friends of this church. I release now upon your life the spirit of prayer. I release upon your lives a spirit of faith. A door of opportunity is open to you. If you will step into it, your prayer life will accelerate. 
the miracles will begin to accelerate. Your life will begin to change. It's a new day is coming for the church. When it gets darker and darker in the world, our light shall shine. Today, Lord, we arise. We arise. We shine. Our light is coming. Our light is here. The glory of the Lord upon our lives and hearts. God bless you. God bless each one of you. If you want to stay behind in this wonderful atmosphere.